discussion. Uh, ML and AI is gaining more and more popularity, but in a way, people are kind of building big models and big systems. But there are a lot of interesting opportunities in making things um, artificial intelligence smarter and bring, bringing it to the edge. And that has a lot of interesting impl implications, both from the technology side, but also from the impact side. And that's what I would like to highlight and discuss today. I'm Rachel Gordon, an AI and robotics reporter. And my name is Pupa Kotabande. I'm the Vice President of Product at Sintian Corporation. Today we're having a conversation with Eugeni Yusuf. He is the chairman of the Tiny ML Foundation and senior director at Qualcomm Research, where he leads a hardware R&D team. Yevgeny has been with Qualcomm since 2005 after joining from IBM, where he was a master in leading products in advanced silicon technologies. He has a PhD in solid state physics. He's co-edited 20 books. He's published more than 150 papers, and he's an inventor on more than 60 issued and filed patents. So Yevgeny, you have this brilliant engineering mind, and you've logged years of research and so so-called hardcore silicon technologies, micro electromechanical systems, and user interface technologies. And even before that, in the 90s, you were working on something called gate dielectrics, which involves storing more charge in smaller volume. And you later co-founded the Tiny ML Foundation. So have you always been interested in making things smaller? First of all, hello everyone, and it is a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting and thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our ideas about tiny ML, uh, how um, important and how fascinating this field is and what kind of opportunities people can do in this field in the future. But back to your question, Rachel. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting observation. Uh, I've never thought about this, that... Uh, I've been doing a uh, tiny sale thing through my professional life. I don't think it's intentional per se, but in a way, I think making things small is always challenging. And I've been always kind of uh, excited about doing challenging and uh, disruptive technology type of projects, the ones that have impact. So that, that that's, that's basically kind of my DNA. And uh, back to the tiny email question, uh, yes, I think, uh, and, and we'll talk about this through this uh, discussion, uh, ML and AI is gaining more and more popularity, but in a way people are kind of building big models and big systems, but there are a lot of interesting opportunities in making things um, artificial intelligence smarter and bring, bring it to the edge. And that has a lot of interesting impl implications, both from the technology side, but also from the impact side. And that's what I would like to highlight and discuss today is the highlight and the importance of tiny ML for the things we, we do around us on the, on the technology side, but also on the, on the society side. Yeah, I totally agree. I think actually the beauty of tiny ML, one of the beauties of tiny ML is um, as Evgeny mentioned, People have been talking about artificial intelligence for 50 years, and it's definitely gained popularity, but most of that is being done in big servers in the cloud, consuming lots of energy and requiring a lot of computational power. What TinyML is enabling pretty much everyone to do to bring that decision-making right at the interface. So you mentioned that Yevgeny have been, has been working on the a user interface for for a very long time and if you think about the natural interface between humans and machines this is really the sweet spot for tiny ml to take the um basically events in the analog world and translate it in a way that can be processed by machines right at the point where the occurrence happens and not really have to transmit the data over uh, large volumes and that's that's really wonderful so we're excited to be part of the tiny ml foundation with you that's an excellent point Pupak. i think just to follow on on this uh, i think we all uh, live in a more and more in the digital world whether we want it or not and what tiny ml allows it connects uh, the the analog world the, the world around us the beautiful world around us to the digital world to the world of ones and zeros 
and and, uh, and tiny melody the engine that con converts the, the the analog world into the digital world in a super uh, efficient power efficient manner because uh, we all want to digitize everything and kind of uh, make it actionable uh, but the way it happens today unfortunately is is not optimal because what, what happens there for example if, if you take computer vision as an example you take a picture um, uh, with your with your phone with your camera. It it, it, it takes some energy. It, it nothing comes it, nothing comes for free, right? You, you take a picture. Your phone works. Your, your battery works. It, it takes some energy. Then you transmit this energy to the cloud. This this picture to the cloud, and it, it takes energy too. Actually, quite 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 a bit of energy. We just don't think about it. It, it we, we just take it uh, for for granted. And, and then they do some image recognition on, on the cloud. And then, then on your Facebook, you see like, hey, this is me, this is my friend. And again, we all think it's free, but it, it all co costs cost some energy. And it's super inefficient. Like what happens, for example, if your network is down? So basically you, you cannot accomplish this mission, right? And by contrast, Tiny ML allows you to do this analytics right at the edge. It's super energy efficient. It's super fast in terms of latency and you have no dependency on the network. It's, it's, it's all reliable. And what I will also would like to highlight, you do it in a way that you preserve people's privacy because uh, you don't send pictures out so hackers can intercept it and do something bad about your pictures or anything. So what, what quite often uh, tiny ML technology, what they do, the output of tiny ML devices is metadata, like, hey, I see two people in the room. Uh, but without kind of disclosing, without revealing their identities. And, and this is super powerful from the privacy perspective. And I think privacy aspects are going to be becoming more and more important for, for this kind of digital AI, AI driven world. And that's what makes tiny ML unique. And just kind of very briefly to define tiny ML for people who are not familiar with tiny ML. Tiny ML is a combination of machine learning techniques and uh, approaches and algorithms and hardware that allow to do this uh, machine intelligence at the very edge of the physical and analog world and, and, and the digital world at super low power. I think typically we define it as one milliwatt of power. And, and uh, this is very low compared, like for example, just as a reference point, your, your, your phone consumes uh, about um, one watt of power depending on different tasks. So we're talking about a factor of thousand less power than kind of people typically use for a cell phone. So again, just to sum up, the unique features of tiny ml it's extremely low power it's fast latency it's privacy by design and super reliable no dependency on, on network that's kind of on the technology side but i definitely would like to dive into the implications and impact of uh, tiny ml for what is going to be happening in the future in this conversation as well yeah absolutely but before we get into that you know micro this is all happening on microcontrollers and they've played quite a dominant role in shaping the technologies that are you know, populating our modern life, but ultra low power also means constraint on processors. So if we're exhausting brute force options, then we need to improve this little family of architectures and hardware and algorithms and software. So is tiny ML really superior to plain old ML? And I think we can get into some of the use cases here. Uh, I wouldn't call it superior. I think it's it's more like a complementary. But I would should I should also say uh, tiny ML is a must use technology for any people, any systems who are interested in deploying uh, ML and machine machine intelligence at, at the scale at, at the global scale. Because without tiny ML, we are, we are basically will be dead soon. Just to give you. A reference point on the energy consumption. There was a very interesting research done at MIT last year. And what they concluded was that uh, the way IT and ML and AI is evolving today by 2040, and it's basically in 15, 18 years, uh, we'll be feeding all the energy we are producing in the world just to feed computers. There will be no energy available for people. And, and this is pretty scary proposition because again, the way we do ML today, cloud-based ML today, it, it's like what you said earlier, Rachel, it's, it's a brute force. So I think we need to be really smart how we do it and, and, and why we do it. And then tiny ML allows you to, to do it. It basically gives people the tool and, and, and the knowledge to solve problems around you in a very efficient way, not just kind of a brute force way. Rachel, I think you also mentioned architectures. I think, um... 
There is definitely room for new types of architectures that are best suited for tiny ML applications as well, because I think there's there it's possible to um, implement tiny algorithms for machine learning right at the edge on traditional architectures as well. But um, I know that, for example, at Sentian, we're definitely investing in new architectures for the edge. And I know that there's other companies that are doing it. So it is driving um, innovation on the algorithm side, on the hardware development, on the device development. And it's all driven by having a better solution for that interface between um, analog and the digital world. Right. That's another excellent point, Pupak, just again to, to, to continue on, on this one. I think what makes Tiny ML so unique and so interesting, it's really a, a kind of a cross-functional, it's, it's a holistic system. It's not just like, hey, I use a cloud and I develop my algorithms. In this case, it's all about solutions. So you think about the solutions, voice recognition, people recognition, glass breakage, all, all these kind of things. And then people who, who design the system, they think about the whole system holistically. They, they co-design the system, like what kind of algorithms I use for this particular task. And based on this, you design your hardware in a way that is super efficient to run the, the, this kind of algorithm. So that's kind of makes it unique. And just one more comment on, on the microcontroller point you made earlier, Rachel, is... Uh, Microcontrollers today, you can think it's about kind of small and dime type of device, but it's not true. I mean, what microcontrollers today are is basically what your Pentium computer was, desktop computer was 20 years ago in terms of compute power. It is still constrained. You don't have too much memory. Typically, we're talking about like megabytes of memory, maybe from like one to 10 megabytes of memory. But if I remember my first Pentium computer, it was like 20 megabytes of memory and it was like running at 80 megahertz. And microcontrollers today are a factor of 10 more than this. So there's a lot of compute power in, the, in, the, in these tiny devices. And that's what enables these uh, um, uh, machine learning uh, capabilities of this type of devices. And on top of this, you have a dedicated hardware acceleration. Pretty much all tiny ML companies that have a dedicated um, acceleration to do this type of uh, uh, ML in, in hardware. Again, that's what makes it super interesting from the technology side and also very efficient on, on the problem solving side. Right. And the use cases for ML models that are frugal enough to be working at the edge are boundless. So what do you think are some of the most promising prospects for market growth for AI at the edge? And I, and I want to talk a little bit more about the use cases too, because in particular, predictive maintenance, smart cities, smart agriculture in places where there's low, electri low electricity and uh, not a great connection. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's an excellent point. That's kind of where the beauty of tiny ML is, not as, as much on the technology slide. Like, like again, by contrast, if, if you do uh, big ML, the, the cloud-based ML, there is a class of families, NLP, natural language processes. It's like a big field, right? Uh, and many people working there. So in, in tiny ML, the beauty is, is in the diversity. So you, you give this technology to people, to different verticals, and people find ways to use it for different type of applications. That's kind of a general comment. Uh, but more specifically, if you look at verticals, I see a lot of traction in tiny ML and a lot of opportunities there in industrial IoT, because as all industries are going through the digitalization, uh, I think that's important kind of to get data from analog world and digitize them and make them act actionable. And you mentioned predictive maintenance is one of them. For example, there are tiny ML companies, they digitize oil industry in the, in the US. You put tiny ML devices in all these oil pumps and gas lines in, in the US, and you can pre prevent leaks, you can make maintenance, and it creates a lot of kind of positive impact there, both on the environmental side, on the economic side, uh, on the uh, saving, saving time uh, side. So that, that's kind of one big area in industrial IoT, predictive maintenance, um, and uh, an anomaly detection, the, 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 this type of thing. So I think the other big area is smart everything. So basically it's smart city, smart home. So you, you can deploy all, all of these devices um, around you. And again, the key feature there is, is, is the low power, easy to install and, and privacy. Specifically, we're talking about computer vision. You can put this 
tiny vision type of devices in your office, in, in, in your bathroom, actually, and or in, in, in your parents' bathroom or elderly people. And then if there is something that happens there, like, like a fall detection, for example, uh, you're not violating privacy. You, you're, you're basically, you can get the, the, the information, you can get the data, make it actionable. Or another kind of example, we've been talking to some companies on this, you can deploy this type of devices, vision devices in every hotel, for example, in every room. And if all, all of a sudden there is a fire in the hotel, uh, emergency responders, they know what rooms are occupied and which ones are empty. So they will go and save people in those rooms who are occupied, right? And you do it in a way you, you, you preserve uh, privacy there. So it's, it's really kind of this smart thing, smart motion, making all things smarter without kind of breaking the loss of physics in terms of energy and without breaking the loss kind of, of people's uh, being ethical and, and, and privacy. I think that that's kind of another area. And uh, I would say consumer electronic is also a big one. So I think we see more and more interest in consumer devices like laptops, wearables, AR, XR type of devices to become smart and kind of get more information from, from the ambient, what, what happens around you. And tiny ML is a key technology to do it. In fact, I believe like, for example, XR, AR would not be possible without tiny ML because you really need to collect a lot of information around you, but you, you don't really have a battery to, to put it on your on your a AR or VR type of device. So it's, it's kind of a must to do there. That's again, kind of in the consumer space. And the one I'm interested in, in, in particular is healthcare. I think usually healthcare is kind of a little bit behind because of the regulations and other things, but you can do a lot of things there by, by putting tiny ML devices. So like on your body, in your, in, in your environment and make this information also actionable for, for whatever we are trying to do, like implantable type of devices, uh, hearable type of devices. I think there are many companies that are developing better hearing aids uh, using tiny ML technology. So kind of a lot of opportunities in this space, but again, you can use as many examples as white and as wild your imagination is. Yeah, I just want to expand on your healthcare application because I'm pretty excited about that as well. Um, because there is a lot of post care that right now is either insufficient. For example, if someone is at the hospital and they get discharged, um, the the interaction between the person and the doctor is not usually sufficient to really manage their health going forward. And we found use cases where, for example, a doctor wants to monitor a patient's breathing sounds. And it was very difficult. And for this, they, they needed to stay in the hospital. They needed to record the sounds. And then there would be a, a physician that would be kind of monitoring it and looking at all these sounds and seeing, okay, is this person coughing too much? Is he wheezing? Is he, you know, having issues breathing? And with a technology like tiny ml we can actually make devices that you can send home with the patient that's just listening and and recording significant events so there was like 10 coughs in the at night or the patient patient wheezed so you're not actually recording every sound that's happening which is a big privacy concern and hipaa violation and all sorts of all sorts of issues but um but you're just recording these significant events and then only those significant events are transmitted to the physician and if there is an issue then they can get alerted and the patient may be readmitted so that's a that's a real good use case that we are seeing people are starting to implement another one i wanted to highlight is um there is over the past few years there's a lot of noise around smart factory and factory automation and what people always um, overlook is the fact that there is a massive installed base in manufacturing and in a lot of cases this these factories that were built in the 70s still have a lot of life in them They're, the machines are still capable of being used for manufacturing but in order to make those factories smart and automated people are ripping things out and putting new equipment in and with uh, you know, small devices powered by tiny ML, you can actually turn these old analog devices into machines that generate digital data that can then be controlled much, much easier. So there is a huge application around retrofitting the installed base that actually extends the life of the machines that are already out there, uh, which we're excited about as well. Yeah, and you, you can do it in a very low cost and power efficient Absolutely. way. Absolutely. 
yeah. yeah. Couple of kind of examples related to this is um, uh, uh, analog gauge detection. So you have a lot of kind of in these factories, you have a lot, a lot of analog gauges and to replace them with new digital ones, it's a huge cost, both installation cost and, and, and hardware cost. But what you can do instead, you can have small tiny ML cameras doing uh, all kind of your, your, your meters at home. If it's an old meter, you can put this analog uh, tiny ML cameras and you can digitize and, and make it actionable, uh, for example. Or you have a lot of kind of old uh, dumb cameras, security cameras all, all over the world uh, in, in cities. And there, instead of replacing them with new expensive cameras, you can just add tiny ML technology there and, and, and or HAI technology and, 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 and make them smart. And kind of one more point related to the to the to the um, use cases, like when Pupak was talking about this hospital discharge. So it's not only about use cases; it's going to bring the whole way, new wave of new business models, uh, and that's kind of is going to make this tiny ML motion and impact even more multiplicative in, in, in a way that people will start thinking like, hey, I didn't have this data before, now I have this data. How, how I can develop a new business model? It will be kind of a way for business model development based on the technology capabilities. Yeah, I think we're going to be getting a little bit closer to more personalized healthcare if we can have someone in their home yeah. with a sensor and we're continuously monitoring breathing patterns at night and gait speed. And then we can implement more precision healthcare and say, okay, maybe this patient X has a, presents a similar case as patient Y in the hospital, but we don't know what their day-to-day -day necessarily looks like. We're getting a snapshot of this patient at probably their worst moment in a hospital. So I, I'm also super excited about that. But something I'm also noticing and a little bit concerned with is, are, are we starting now to overuse ML and apply deep learning where maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be added? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, especially um, around deep learning, because sometimes we get excited about the technology and we kind of throw it at every use case. And part of um, our job uh, is to make sure that we're using the right tool for each of the applications. So in a lot of cases, that may not be necessary um, and you end up actually consuming more power or doing things that you, uh, doesn't give you the results that you want. And then it actually ends up hurting the cause of proliferating uh, machine learning at the edge because if people don't have the experience that they're expecting, then, um, they'll become sour on it and they won't really become champions of it. So that's something that um, I think within the Tiny ML Foundation, we're also looking at making sure that we choose the applications carefully. And then as Evgeny mentioned, holistically looking at the hardware, the algorithms and the tools that we're using for each application, um, which I think is super important as well. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, just to, to add to this, I, I think there is definitely, uh, or there was a kind of a hype curve when people thought that deep learning can solve any kind of problem. And I think this, this was quite misleading. And I think many people still believe so. And to me, kind of a cold shower realization was when, when COVID came. Because before COVID, we were, we all had this kind of aphoria, like, hey, we have a lot of data, we throw the data and, and machine learning in the cloud is going to tell us what to do, right? So and, and, and when COVID started, uh, we we had a lot of data, but the, the, the way it was managed, the way it was handled by still by using spreadsheets, right? <laughs> at every kind of level, at the county level, at the city level. So basically AI ML failed big time in my, in my opinion. It was a realization that you cannot really take a human out of the picture. So you, you really need to think about problem solution, not just kind of a brute force approach uh, there. And, uh, and I, I think uh, when you think about a problem solution, uh, deep learning is one of the tools, but it's not the only one. So you can really solve a problem by using it in a more efficient and in, in a better way. Like just again, to, to be specific here, if you're talking about computer vision, uh, for example, um, you can do it by deep learning, but you can use still old fashioned computer vision type of algorithms using cascades, using deep forest type of algorithms. They're super more efficient and the accuracy is actually in many cases is better, uh, it's not worse, even better than the deep learning type of things, right? Again, it's a tool how, how, how to use it. Same as also for audio type of type of signals. You can use deep learning, but you can use other type of approaches like time sequence and, and, and so on. You really, it's all about problem solving and that's what 
TinyML allows you to do on the technology side, but also TinyML allows you to do it at the mindset side because it's all about problem solving, not about the brute force side of approach. It's super important for people to re realize that it's not only deep learning. There are other tools. And, and in fact, what, I, what we see recently in, in the past year or so, many companies are adding classical algorithms to their tool chain. Like, for example, TensorFlow added classical algorithms to their MATLABs is adding classical algorithms in, in addition to CNN type of algorithms because people re realize it's, you really need to give these tools to people and then they will figure out what works best. And what role is community playing into all of this? You were so instrumental in bringing together all of these people to work on these problems and tiny ML for good. And now you're really helping democratize all of this technology. So how, how are all of these minds fused together helping the problem? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent kind of vector to discuss. Uh, when when uh, we started TinyML at Qualcomm about 10 years ago, I, su I was super excited about the technology part of it because it was very challenging. It was very interesting. You really need to have a lot of talented people from different disciplines, hardware, software, people, and so on. So that was kind of my first wave of excitement with TinyML. So when we developed this Qualcomm technologies at Qualcomm, we realized we, we really need to start working on developing ecosystem. So we start working with partners like uh, Google and uh, smaller companies and uh, kind of build a whole uh, uh, startup ecosystem. I think Cintion was there from, from the very beginning, pioneering low power research and, and many other companies. So like, like that, that was my second wave of excitement. Like, wow, like there are so many people around and they're so passionate about the, doing the things. And, and then we started to connect these dots. And around like 2018, we started TinyML Foundation as a nonprofit organization really to drive this community forward, to drive this ecosystem forward. And, and, and to me, it became super clear and super uh, obvious that uh, the power of community is, is very important here because uh, in the tiny ML case, we are given this technology, we're democratizing AI, we're giving this technology to people, to companies, and, and having this connection between technology and, 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 and people is uh, super uh, important to drive this kind of innovations and use cases we discussed before um, into kind of into, into high, high, high volumes and, 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 and new dimensions. So in the community, the beauty of the community also is diversity. Like you can do a lot of things in one company, in two companies, in five companies. But like today we have a tiny 45 uh, tiny email groups in 37 countries, basically covering the whole uh, world. And you have so many different angles of this, like different countries, they have different aspects and different uh, uh, priorities in, in, in tiny emails. Like for example, companies in Africa, they're developing these things to help their communities. Uh, and there are many, many examples there. So it's, it's really the, the community is very important in terms of the, the ideas, the brain power, but also the diversity, like everyone is bringing its own unique angle uh, to the table. And what advice would you have to anyone who wants to get involved in this industry? Uh, that's a good question. I think in general, uh, my advice to people who are entering like workforce, new things uh, is, uh, is, is very basic. Just uh, listen to your heart and uh, follow, follow your passion because like you have one life, just do what you like and love what you do type of thing. Right. But to the extent you can, I mean, there are always constraints, right? Uh, but specifically in, in, in this area, in, in the high tech area today, in the ML, AI today, and in the tiny ML today, I think it becomes more and more important to learn uh, how to solve problems. I think problem solution is, is very important. Like when I was in, in graduate school, uh, it was more about knowledge. Like you need to acquire a certain number of things, knowledge, I would say, to be a professional. I think these days the knowledge is evolving so fast, so you really need to learn how to how to learn new things, right? How 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 how, how to adapt, like like what uh, like even use if you use tiny ML as an example, where we are with tiny ML today is very different where we were a year ago, and two years from now we will be very in a very different position too. So really, kind of having this problem solving mindset and 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 really be able to learn things quickly and also work kind of interdisciplinary, I think this will become many important. Like in my professional life, I already had uh, have had several chapters. I think for new generations entering this new force, people are going to have a, a lot of chapters in their, in their lives. So I think kind of being able to learn 
quick and, and kind of find what they like and, and make an impact by, by, by doing what they do. I think that that, that, that is, uh, I think will be the new thing. And I, I encourage people to think more about this, about themselves, like what they like and what they do, but also about the whole the whole world, how they can make a, a better world around. And by the way, the, the Tiny ML Foundation mission statement is we see a new world with a trillion of uh, devices enabled by Tiny ML that work together autonomously to make a better and more sustainable world for all of us. So that that's kind of aligns well with the, with our mission statement. Absolutely. Yeah. I think just just to add one sentence to what you were saying also is I think my advice is to not so much fall in love with the technology, which as, as engineers we do, and that's okay. But really, um, we're at the forefront of inventing new use cases. So let your imagination run wild and think about the, exactly like it, Penny said, the problems you can solve and then apply the technology to 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 solve them. Well, thank you both for the beautiful words. It was absolutely a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.